John. Uh, my name is Brendan Anderson. I'm the founder and CEO of Climate People, a climate tech recruiting firm out of Boston, Massachusetts. Brendan, thanks so much for making time joining us on the Heavy Podcast. Uh, before we dive in, talk a little bit about Climate People and what, what, are you, what are you building over there, which is very interesting. Give us a thumbnail version of your career to date. Uh, great. Yeah. Th first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's um, it's nice to be here with you and, and you know talk about climate people and, and the work that we're doing. Um, so I think like most people, I kind of fell into recruiting. It wasn't exactly what I wanted, you know, what I went to school for, uh, not even close really. Um, so I was a history major in college. I actually, so I grew up in Vermont and I think that's really the seeds of where climate people uh, ultimately was planted, uh, being, you know, an outdoors enthusiast, uh, went away to college at Hofstra University down in New York and was a history major. I thought I was going to be a high school social studies teacher. Originally, that's what my uh, focus was. And when I graduated, I interviewed for a couple jobs and didn't get hired and I needed to find a job. So, uh, so I'm a little older. So this is back when I had to actually like look at the New York Times, the Sunday Help Wanted ads and go through the Help Wanted ads. Uh, the jobs that really appealed to me uh, were recruiting positions because of the interaction with people. So I applied to a few recruiting roles and landed a position in Manhattan uh, back in early 1999. So this was really the kind of the, the peak of the dot-com era. And I got my start um, back then. So I worked, I've been in recruiting ever since. Uh, I've worked in New York, uh, moved to Seattle and started up an agency in Seattle in late 1999. After the dot-com bubble burst and 9-11, the company I worked for had uh, shut that office down and ended up moving me to Boston. So I ended up settling here in Boston in 2002 and have been working in tech recruiting the entire time. Uh, here in Boston, most of my customers revolved around either healthcare, biotech, medical device, and education, or then kind of related um, technology enablement companies within those sectors. Um, so I naturally gravitated towards working with customers that had some kind of social impact. They were doing some good. And I've been focusing on recruiting for uh, technologists that entire time. So mostly software engineers, data scientists, uh, product and user experience folks. Um, eventually in 2018, I started my own firm and I really was focusing on that social impact side, mostly in the education and the health tech space. And that was good, but ultimately when the pandemic hit, it really opened my eyes to the, the need, especially on the climate side. So ironically enough, it was a global pandemic that really forced me to think deeply about climate change and the impact of climate change, both in terms of the health implications, as well as the, the, the disparate gaps in, you know, who, who made out um, through the pandemic. And it uh, obviously at the same time, we had everything that was happening with the, the George Floyd murder and the social unrest that was happening around racial injustice. And I decided at that point that the work that I wanted to do every single day, I really wanted it to have a lot of meaning and I wanted it to have a lot of impact. And I started to write down the things that were really important to me. And at the top of the list was climate change and really wanting to make a bigger difference around climate change outside of the you know, personal choices that we were making as a family to decarbonize our house. So that's eventually what led me to start the company. Um, officially uh, rebranded the company late last year, but went live just a few months ago. Oh, well, that's exciting. And thanks for the background. So quite a diverse uh, you know, experience that you, you've gone through. And it seems like the overall theme that you, know, you really enjoy working with people uh, you, you, you know, as a, as a thought leader in staffing and talent acquisition, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a trending topic, especially these days um, with the war for talent out there being real. So tell us a little bit more about some of the trends that you were very excited about. Obviously, you've been through different cycles of the industry. What are you researching? What are you studying? What are you thinking is the next big thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think a lot of it actually, it, um, I hope that some of the trends are, are the things that I actually acted on. Um, you know, as I, as I think about a lot of the conversations that I've had with candidates over the last several years, this has been ongoing, 
you know, one of the things I ask every single candidate that I talk to and any of the recruiters that I've managed and trained, I think it's really important to understand why somebody's looking for a new job. What's really important to them, and you know, is that are they going to be able to find that within their current company? And so the thing that kept coming up over the years, every time I was talking to candidates was the re one of the reasons they were leaving. And oftentimes it was one of the first things that they talked about was they just didn't align with what the company did and they didn't really find meaning in the business. And so I think that one of the trends, and this has been ongoing for years. And I think based on everything that's transpired really over the last year and a half, um, is that people really want meaningful work. I think that's a huge trend amongst the candidates that I talk to. And again, I'm looking at it through the lens of, of course, you know, people that are approaching me because I, my company is called Climate People. And so those people obviously want meaningful work, but uh, even those folks that aren't necessarily saying, I want to work in climate, most of them are saying, I wanna actually work for a company that's doing something that matters, that's having some social impact. So I think that's one of the key trends. And then of course, um, the remote and hybrid work situation has dramatically changed things, at least in my you know, world where I'm placing software engineers and put people in technology, they don't physically have to be there. And so that's made a huge impact. And I don't think that trend's gonna, that's gonna change. Uh, I actually, uh, I was reading just recently about a survey. I think it was somewhere between like 96% of the people in technology wanted either a fully remote or a hybrid position. Uh, so that that's obviously a huge trend. And then I think the last piece, which is something I'm hearing a lot on the client side is the focus on diversity and inclusion, uh, both in terms of their uh, recruitment practices, but also I think in terms of the way that they're trying to run their companies. Um, Cause it's not an exercise in checking the box and saying, hey, we just, we wanna get more diverse applicants or we wanna hire more diverse people. Um, it's really the inclusivity piece. It's working with outside consultants to help strategically change the business and focus on diversity, not just because we wanna hire a diverse workforce, but because countless studies have been done that a more diverse and inclusive workforce is going to make for a better business. And so I think those three things for me are the things that I find myself talking about literally every day. Well, that's, you know, definitely interesting space, especially given the current environments, so, you know, coming out of pandemic and, you know, how, how companies just view overall the talent acquisition space, talent retention. I think those are very interesting, you know, areas that you and I could probably spend the rest of the episode talking about. Yeah. Um, when when it comes to one area that I talk to a lot of executives about, regardless of the industry, is the whole interviewing space, because it's it's very challenging to master. I'm yet to see anybody be really good at that, because you know it's a combination of art and science. And for you representing the both sides, representing the candidate and representing the hiring organization, the hiring team. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your strategy, some of the recommendations that you you provide to the to the both sides to make sure that that first experience you set the right expectations and just overall increase your batting average when it comes to interviewing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that's changed a lot. I get like a lot of things, right? Like most of these questions, if you had asked me a year and a half ago or two years ago perhaps the answer would have been different. I think the interviewing piece is, a, it's a challenge and it's evolving um, in part because of the whole remote aspect, right? I mean, so you, you're tr trying to hire a candidate or a company trying to make a decision on whether I want to hire this person to become an employee and never have actually met them, that's a challenge. And so, you know, there's a, there's a part of it that it's about making sure that you have the right fit and that the process itself, you don't compromise the integrity of the process, but at the same time, you have to be mindful of the candidate experience. And so in a normal, I'd say a kind of traditional technology recruiting process would usually be three steps. There'd be some kind of an introduction interview with either a hiring manager or an internal recruiter. Uh, there'd probably be some kind of technical assessment, a code challenge, 
and then there'd be an on-site interview, which might be a half a day or a full day, but they get it done in really one shot. Nowadays, companies aren't doing that. So they want to maintain that the integrity of that process, but that on-site interview, if you're asking a candidate to go through six to eight, 30 to 45 minute Zoom calls, people aren't gonna, people don't want to do that all in one day. And if now you're stretching out over multiple days, it creates a real challenge to get a candidate through the entire interview process before they would get an offer with another company. So it's a challenge, right? Like you don't want to compromise the integrity of the process and, and start shaving pieces off of the process. But if the candidate has interview fatigue and Zoom fatigue, they end up potentially not performing well on the interviews or opting out. So what I do with my clients, first of all, is just understand what they're looking for, what the hiring process is, and try to identify if there are overlaps between individual conversations. Could we put two people in a Zoom together, which in and of itself isn't awesome, but you know, it is a potential solution. So how do we you know, streamline the process so that we maintain that integrity to make sure that it's the right fit, but we also don't stretch this interview process out over too many weeks because in software, you know, you're not gonna be able to successfully land a candidate. If it takes more than two weeks to get a person hired, for the most part, you're gonna be lucky if you land that candidate. Right, right, absolutely. And you know, I just spent some time talking to talking to an, an executive yesterday on this particular topic and something that he mentioned is around the flawed, I guess, mentality that you know, during the interview, there's so much focus is on your past experience and some of the things that you have gone through versus really focusing on the strengths that you're really missing on the team and really identifying the candidate who can bring that, bridge that gap. I think it's very unique space, very interesting. Um, so yeah, some of the strategies you cover definitely make sense in terms of really building that two-way street almost and providing the opportunity for the candidate also to ask the questions and make the determination from their side is very important. Yeah, I, I would say, well, actually one, one uh, kind of additional point that I would make, and it's, um, it, there are clients that I'm working with, and there's certainly a lot of companies out there that they're mindful of this, and they're trying to improve the process. But there are times in which, in their effort to improve the process and speed things up, they're deteriorating that candidate experience. An example of that would be the first interaction that they have with a candidate if they're asking the candidate to take a code challenge or do a technical assessment. And that's the first introduction because they're trying to speed the process up. I get it. But with candidates interviewing at multiple companies, if the first introduction they have to one organization is doing a code challenge and then all the other companies that they're talking to e either over the phone via zoom, or maybe even in person, that's pretty rare, but, um, the candidate's going to be less inclined to want to do that technical interview first without actually getting to know the company at all. So it is, it is a, it's a big challenge. Um, and I, I totally agree with you as far as how you're assessing their past experience versus looking at the potential that they bring for the future is something I think every company should really be mindful of, particularly as it relates to the competition that's involved. And because now the remote workforce piece is, huge it now allows companies to hire all over the country right mm -hmm. so you, you know there's more there's more competition for these candidates because now they've got companies all over the all, all over the place reaching out to them and quite frankly there's more competition for their employees that could get recruited to go to other companies so yeah, right. it's a challenge. Absolutely. absolutely those are very very great points in terms of um, the, the trends been on the rise the last couple of years as you know is elevated through pandemic and coming out of this the whole concept of future of work uh, how people how people work how pe people people collaborate how they communicate with each other and what's going to keep them on the jobs talk to us a little bit about your thoughts how do you think about future of work contingent workforce gig workers all of that you know those concepts uh, share some thoughts from that perspective yeah, uh, so I don't do anything in the um, the gig economy, so I don't know. Although I did actually, it's, it's interesting to bring that up because I actually just read something the other day that I think that um, there were a number of employees. I can't remember exactly what the statistic was. So it's probably a terrible point, but it was it was a 
it was a higher than I expected statistic of people leaving their jobs during COVID to take gig jobs or to, to be their own business owners as opposed to working for somebody else. I don't remember the stat, but it was high. I don't want to say it wasn't 50% or anything like that, but it was a, it was a much bigger number than I had expected. Um, I don't deal too much in the gig economy, so I don't know that space, but at least in the full-time kind of permanent hiring and contingent world, um, I think the future for at least, again, through the lens that I'm looking at it, which is mostly in the technology space, the future of workforce is a mobile workforce. It's a, it's a remote workforce, maybe a hybrid workforce. I think that it presents opportunities for more efficiency. I think it really, it, it presents the opportunities for companies to be more innovative and thoughtful about what are the perks, right? So be, you know, Having a remote employee, that in and of itself could be a perk. Giving people half days on Fridays, at least in the summertime. There was a, I, I read an interesting article just yesterday that I think it, in Iceland, I know it's Iceland, but 86% of the people in Iceland now work four, four day work weeks. And that there are companies here in the US, um, including, um, oh, there was two, a couple of tech companies uh, that are going to be moving to. Um, four-day work weeks starting next year. Right. So th th there's a lot of creative things. I think ultimately there should be challenges around building culture in a remote workforce, but I think companies can get super innovative about the way that they're approaching us. Right, absolutely. Those are very interesting points. And, you know, which brings me further to another area I want to touch upon is kind of that, that war on retention, that, you know, war for talent just overall is real, but companies that are very competitive and do succeed in the space of really surrounding themselves of building high performing teams, create an environment of high retention where actually employees and workers, um, you know, feel challenged, but at the same time have the kind of the platform to be, you know, to, to grow, to, you know, self-actualize and things like that. Share with us some thoughts, you know, how do you think about, you know, retention? What do you, what do you, how, how do you advise some of your clients uh, when it comes to retaining the top talent? I, th I, th I think this, it comes back to that piece I was talking about earlier about really understanding why a candidate is leaving their job. Um, and uh, personally, again, again, just looking through the lens of somebody who's focusing on climate and climate tech and um, trying to mobilize a workforce to go from other tech jobs or kind of finance and accounting software jobs and work on impactful uh, climate solutions. But I think ultimately the number one tool for retention is to provide your employees with meaningful work. If, you, if the people that work for you are doing something that's meaningful and they feel like they're contributing and that their work is valued and important, no matter what they do at the company. I have a, I have a client that I work really closely with the executive assistant to the CEO and the COO, and her value to that organization is quite high given all the things that she does. And I've made sure to tell the client that, and they've said to that they know. So it doesn't matter the role. It doesn't matter the level of the person. It's really, do they feel like they're actually making an impact? and is the work that they're doing meaningful. And then I think on top of it, it's just, it, I think it's basic stuff. Like, are you helping people grow their careers? Are they learning and adding new skills? To me, those are the biggest tools. M money is great, but ultimately that's not the main reason why people look for jobs. Um, obviously when they're going from one job to the next, they wanna get a raise, but it's not the number one component. I think it's workplace environment, it's that impact they're growing their skills and, and they have a path to grow within a company that's doing something that people care about. To me, I think that's the, those are the biggest things. So if you're not in a company that's doing meaningful work and you're not providing opportunities for your people to grow, then your people are probably looking for a job right now. Right. And with so much opportunity available out there, it's, you know, it's a no brainer. So it's, you know, it makes so perfect sense. It, it seems so simple, but oftentimes overlooked components when it comes to retaining the top talent. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. Yeah. In terms of your space where you operate in, um, 
tell us a little bit more about what are some of the the most in demand skill sets that are very very difficult to find very scarce these days and how do you go about sourcing that type of skill yeah um so I think I'll explain more about what Climate People does. So um, it can could, it could frame this up. So we're, our focus and mission is to help with mobilizing uh, the workforce to transition their careers to make an impact in climate change. There are, when I, when I originally wrote my business plan and was creating this the model, um, my original idea and thought was breaking it down based on the industry sectors that we're servicing, right? So basically decarbonizing our economy and, and reducing carbon emissions requires us to change most of the things that we do. So how we transport ourselves, our transportation and how we move goods, um, where we live and the energy efficiency of our homes and our fuel and our energy sources needs to change our whole food system. So the agricultural space, um, the, the just raw materials, the industrial manufacturing and circular economy space, and then obviously energy and our grid and decarbonizing that and modernizing that. So if we're talking about like decarbonizing that everything, um, it requires every kind of job uh, that's out there. So if you are a software engineer, like the people that I place, there's lots of those jobs. If you're a hardware engineer or a mechanical engineer or a chemist or a biologist or an accountant or a marketer or a salesperson, there is a job for you in that sector. What I decided to do as I was moving into the space was really focus on what I knew really well, which was how to place software and technology professionals. Um, so before I move on, I will be adding, and what I'm actually looking for recruiters that bring expertise in different areas. So if there are recruiters out there that have experience with hardware, mechanical, electrical systems, I actually just had a call today with a client that's hiring for 30 positions at least right now, probably 60 positions by the end of the year, but all of the jobs that they're recruiting for are mechanical, electrical, chemical engineering roles, a little outside of my sweet spot, but they've got a ton of money and they're building some amazing uh, hydrogen technology, clean hydrogen. In the software space, it's everything. So for the most part, what I see is full stack engineers, Python, a lot of data heavy, machine learning, artificial intelligence, node, front end, cloud. So a lot of the same kind of skills that would be in other businesses, climate tech companies are hiring for those. I'm really isolating those types of roles to start, but then over time, like I said, we'll be branching out to, to work with these customers on other types of roles. But there's so much business out there. There's all, you don't wanna spread yourself too thin. And you wanna, for me, I really wanna focus on delivering for my clients. So I'm, I'm really focusing on just certain job types for now until I expand. So. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely seems like very niche, you know, space, you know, especially with the type of skill set you know, paired not only from the technical expertise domain, but with some of the soft skills that are required to succeed in those type of environments that adds another layer of complexity. So that's very interesting. Um, in terms of your, your content diet, the sources that you utilize on daily basis to stay ahead of, you know, some of the trends to stay up to date on what's going on in your, in your industry or even beyond that, share with us those, what do you consume on daily basis? A lot, I mean, a lot, a lot. <laughs> Uh, it is basically what I did all of last year. When I made the decision to make this pivot before I wrote a business plan and came up with exactly what I wanted to do, I, I realized that the first thing was I want to actually learn the space. I want to understand what climate change, the actual impact that climate change is having, and what are the solutions out there for climate change, both in terms of the decarbonization of the entire economy, as well as, well, really I'd say three things, decarbonization, adaptation, and then carbon removal. And so uh, there's just so much information out there. Um, that's the stuff that I really enjoy the most, I would say, um, as far as like websites that I go to and kind of newsletters, um, Canary Media is probably my number one uh, go-to. Canary Media is brand new. It was um, a, a partnership between the Rocky Mountain Institute 
and Green Tech Media. So Green Tech Media was really kind of the leader in this space. Uh, they were uh, acquired by Wood McKenzie and Wood, Wood Mac basically put them out of business. So they merged with the Rocky Mountain Institute. The Canary Media is probably the best. They are climate journalists. So if you really wanna understand really um, the business of climate and the science of climate, Canary Media is definitely my go-to. Um, there are a lot of others. I mean, there are a lot of Slack communities. Um, there's a, you know, kind of, uh, I know this is obviously a podcast, but I would uh, promote a couple podcasts as well that are climate specific. One of them is called My Climate Journey, which was founded by Jason Jacobs. Uh, he's a you know, Boston fitness tech guy who started this amazing podcast, which has turned into a community that includes a Slack room. Um, that's a really great uh, podcast and now Slack group. Um, a Matter of Degrees is fantastic podcast. Um, How to Save a Planet is another great podcast. There's a lot. Actually, um, on my website, if you go to climatepeople.com, I have a, a resources page that's under candidates, and it lists all of the different media that I consume on a regular basis that uh, if people are interested in learning more about it, I tried to centralize it all in one place. So. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah, absolutely with so much information being in the, you know, there's a, yeah, available. There's a ton out there. Always. I would, and there's one book, actually, there's one book that I would recommend too. At all the new employees, when they get hired here, um, I send them a copy of a book called All We Can Save. It's probably the best book that I've read in the last at least five years. Um, it's the a, author? The, it's, a, it's actually, um, it's a poems and essays written by over 40 women that are in all of their stories around climate and climate change. So there are the two editors were Catherine Wilkinson and uh, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson were the two editors, but the, the actual book itself was essays and poems all by women, feminist climate leaders. It's really inspiring. Uh, I highly recommend it. So all we can save, I, I would recommend that to everybody. Well, you beat me to the punch because the last question I always ask is what is one book they always recommend to others, which is great recommendation and we'll make that the title available in the show notes for all of our listeners. Any other closing thoughts, any other recommendations? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, from a job search and a recruitment perspective, um, obviously I'm super passionate about this space. I can't recommend enough to, you know, for people to think about like the work that you're doing, if the work that you're doing right now isn't meaningful to you, there are amazing jobs and careers that are working within climate-oriented, climate-based companies that are trying to help save the planet. And so it doesn't matter what your job is, there's probably a job for you in an impactful climate-oriented career. And that uh, one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have is if, I have to, if I'm gonna go work for a company that's a social impact organization, I have to take less money. That's not always the case. Look, if you're working at Google and you've got you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in RSUs that you're getting, I get, you know, yes, you, you'd have to walk away from that. But as far as base salaries are concerned, benefits are concerned, uh, these are highly competitive companies that are getting a lot more venture capital money flowing into them. So there are amazing careers that are helping fight climate change. And that's what we're trying to do is mobilize people to move into that space and, and you know, help make a difference to save the world. That's super exciting and something that we, we definitely we don't encounter on a daily basis. So thank you for sharing that, and providing thank a little you. bit more, shining a little bit more light on that. Uh, Brendan, it's, you know, very short and insightful conversation. I personally learned quite a bit. I love uh, what I love doing with all the guests on the pod is doing another episode recording in about a year, revisit the conversation from a year ago, see everything we've talked about still makes sense, still applies. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that with you. Me too. I look forward to it as well. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.